So two weeks ago, I gave an introduction into spiritual disciplines, and I told you that that would be the basis of my messages for the next uh, couple times. And so I'll begin this morning with a quick introduction or a quick summary uh, of the previous message. When we're saved, when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, uh, there are three steps in our Christian life. First, at the very instant of our salvation, uh, we are saved, we are justified, and God declares us righteous. The blood of Jesus Christ covers our every sin, and our punishment for that sin is paid off in full. Then as we continue our Christian life, the goal is to learn more of Christ, and we strive to become more like Him. And this is a continual process called sanctification, whereby God is making us more righteous. So when we're justified, we are declared righteous, and, but, we, as we are, or, but we, as we are being sanctified, we are being made righteous. And we do this with the help of the Holy Spirit through spiritual disciplines, such as prayer, communion with God, reading and studying God's Word, the Bible, and fellowshipping with God's people. But we will never be fully righteous until the day when Jesus comes back uh, to the sky to call us home to heaven in an event called the rapture. Glorification is an instantaneous event that's in the future at Christ's return that makes us righteous. So we will not be declared righteous at that point. We will not be in the process of being made righteous, but we will be righteous. So today we're going to begin looking at some of these spiritual disciplines, things that we can do uh, to grow our faith, to become more like Christ, to be sanctified. And we're going to start by looking at worship as our first uh, spiritual discipline. Worship begins with our desire to praise God for who He is and for what He has done for us. <clears throat> but as we worship, our hearts and minds are opened up more to who God is and what He has done for us. And that causes us to want to worship him more. And it's a, it's a revolving cycle of learning and worshiping and learning and worshiping. We grow closer and closer to God as we continue to worship. But before we begin uh, on this topic, let's just uh, take a moment to open in prayer. Father, as we gather in your presence today, we thank you for the opportunity to come together as a community of believers to seek your wisdom and your guidance. Lord, we acknowledge you as the author and perfecter of our faith, and we invite your Holy Spirit to move among us, illuminating the truths of your word and deepening our understanding of your love and grace. As we embark on this journey of exploring the spiritual disciplines, may our hearts be receptive to your teachings. Grant us the wisdom to apply these truths to our lives that we might grow in our relationship with you and become more like Christ each day. Lord, prepare our hearts to receive the message you have prepared for us today. May your presence be felt in this place, filling us with peace, joy, and a renewed sense of purpose. We commit this time into your hands, trusting in your full, uh, faithfulness and grace. May all that we do and say bring honor and glory to your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So earlier, Colin read Psalm 63 for us. And this psalm is the words of King David as he was fleeing from his enemies through the wilderness. Even through hardship and attack, David desired to worship his God. The passage is an example of, uh, to us of personal worship. David had been anointed, he had been chosen to be king. But despite his chosen status, he had enemies, enemies that wanted him dead. And despite the circumstances, as David hid in the caves along the cliffs of En Gedi, uh, which is an oasis on the western shores of the Dead Sea, he found time and he found the heart to write one of the most beautiful psalms. And we can learn a lot from David's experience uh, in this passage. And I want to go through this psalm to learn how David worshipped. Firstly, 
David worshiped God as his creator. Verse 1 says, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. And in this verse, David is using the Hebrew name for God, Elohim. Elohim is the Hebrew name for God who is the creator God. We see this in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. It's also a plural noun used in a singular form, which some believe encompasses the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into a singular name, Elohim. So David recognized God as the creator in another psalm. Psalm 139, we read, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. <clears throat> when we worship, we need to consider our creator, the one who made us in his image, the one who, Luke tells us, knows the number of hairs on our head. When I'm at work, I'm, there's often times that I'll step back and look at what I've created. And uh, I'm proud of my work. I might even take a couple of pictures. Might not look like much to you, but I'm proud of it. <laughs> but imagine how much care and concern our God has for his living, breathing creation. We were wonderfully made for a purpose, and this truth can be life-changing. It causes us to lift up our hearts in praise and worship to our creator, God. And in this verse, David uses a second Hebrew word for God. He says, O Elohim, my creator, you are my El. This term, when used as an adjective, means mighty. And when the word is used for a deity, the, it means strength. But it's also used in other situations to describe strength. It can be used to describe mighty men, men of valor, men of rank, mighty heroes. It can be used to describe mighty things in nature, such as an oak tree or a ram. David is saying, O Elohim, my creator, you are my strength, the strong one in charge of my life. And we sang that hymn earlier, praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer. It says, like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. Our God is strong enough to protect us from whatever lies ahead. And in Samuel 17, David talks of his experience tending his father's sheep. He talks about a lion and a bear coming and taking a, a, a lamb from the flock. And David would go after it. He says that he struck down both lions and bears to protect his sheep. So when David talks about his God, the strong and mighty one, David is talking from a place of experience. Verse 2 of that hymn says, He's our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. When builders are going to construct a building, they often, uh, or the first step is to build, is to make a foundation. And in many cases, they will drill down until they hit bedrock, and then they'll form their uh, columns on top of that. And they use bedrock because of its strength, its firmness, its steadiness. It's not going to move, and they can rely on it to hold up the building. That's our God. We can build our lives on his foundation, on his strength, and it will never move. There's a children's song that says, My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. And that's who David is talking about when he says, O God, my creator, you are my strong and mighty God. Earnestly, I seek you. David wants to be in the, pre in the constant presence of his God. He wants God's continual guidance and presence in his life. And that should be our goal as well. David isn't just sitting around waiting for God to show up. No, he's earnestly seeking God. He's an active participant. David goes on to worship God for who he is. He writes that he has beheld the power and the glory of his God. 
In Psalm 119, David also writes, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Or in Psalm 8, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? David sees the power and the glory displayed in creation as well. From the variety of wildlife, plants, and trees, um, the power of the tides, the perfect symmetry of the universe, all these things visible to the naked eye show us the unmatchable power of God. Emmanuel chose how great thou art to close off the service. And the first verse of that says, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. All of nature tells us of who God is. But science takes it even further. For instance, the earth is set at precisely the right distance from the sun to allow life to be on earth. If we were a million miles closer to the sun, we would burn up. And if we were a million miles further away, we would freeze. The atmosphere is 21% oxygen. If it was 25%, fires would spontaneously combust. And if it was only 15%, then humans would suffocate. If the surface gravity on Earth was stronger, too much ammonia and methane would uh, be retained. But if it was weaker, the atmosphere would lose too much water to be able to sustain life. That's just three of the necessary conditions for life to exist on Earth. So not only do the heavens declare the glory of God, but science also declares the glory of God. And no wonder he is worthy of our praise. David has seen the loving hand of God in his life. God has protected him from his enemies. He's given him wisdom and strength in various situations. And David says that love is steadfast. He knows that it has always been there and it's always going to be there in the future. And so he is going to praise God for that love. You probably see God's hand in your life as well. I know it's been evident for me uh, in the, over the last six to eight months. I was out of work for a year and a half and I couldn't understand why I wasn't even getting a single interview. But then it became evident why God had put me in that position. And once the task he had for me was finished, I had an interview the following week and I was working a few days later. God was in control and I knew that he loved me and he had the best intentions for me. But beyond the physical, and this is something that David did not, did not experience in the same way that we do, God showed his great love to us through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. John 3 and 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Back to that song that we're going to close with, How Great Thou Art. The third verse says, And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I, can, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. God sent his son to die on the cross, despite the fact that we had rejected him. God created a way for us to be reconciled back to him through his son. Romans 5 and 6, the verse that my dad was saved through, says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, or at just the very right moment, Christ died for the ungodly. In the ultimate display of love, God gave his son to be the sacrifice for me and for you. And how can I not worship and praise him for that great love. We've looked at some of the reasons to worship and praise God, but when should we do it? 
David talks about meditating on God while he's in bed, and he sings for joy. Nighttime is a, a good time to meditate and focus on God's goodness to us. It's a quiet time with few, fewer distractions. When we can be alone with God, when we can come into his presence and commune with him. But the scripture doesn't say that that's the only time we should worship. In Psalm 59, David also talks about praising God in song in the morning. In verse 16, he says, But I will sing of your strength, I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning, for you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. But again, that doesn't mean that we're limited to just the morning and night, because in Psalm 34, we read, I will bless the Lord at all times. At every moment of the day, in every situation that we find ourselves in, we can, give, we can find something to give God praise and worship for. I might be overworked and stressed and be feeling the effects of that, but I can praise God that I have a job. I might have a sore back or bad knees or a headache, but I can praise God for another day that I can spend in his presence experiencing his goodness to me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. And that brings me to my second section on worship. Let us exalt his name together. Yes, we, are, we should worship and praise God on our own, but we are also expected to worship and praise God corporately. I'd like to read Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, it's only been a couple of years since we were prohibited from meeting together in public in order to flatten the curve. Fortunately, at that time, we were able to pivot and we were able to start offering online services. And we always said it wasn't the same and it wasn't what we wanted, but it allowed us to stay somewhat connected despite the forced separation. Well, after months and months of continual separation or isolation, <clears throat> we were finally able to start meeting again with stringent requirements. And as those requirements slowly reduced, we slowly saw the pews start filling back up. But again, it was slowly. One of the things that we commonly heard, not just here at Long Branch, but th from many churches, was why would I come back and sit in a hard pew when I can watch a service from the comfort of my own couch? But here's the thing. There's so much more to cor corporate worship than just learning from a sermon and listening to some music. And so as we look at this passage, I hope we'll add to our understanding of why we gather together as Christians for worship and the job that God has for every single one of us to do as we gather. So I'd like to look at three truths about corporate worship. And these three truths come from Hebrews 10, uh, verses 24 and 25. The first truth we're going to consider is that God knows we need encouragement. This comes from the very first part of chapter of verse 24, which says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Now, sometimes we read this passage and we focus on uh, the next verse, 25, um, about not neglecting to meet together. 
And sometimes that's required because there might be some who uh, struggle, who, that, who need to hear that thing and struggle to get up and get ready on a Sunday morning to uh, come together with their church. And it's a, an important command not to neglect meeting together. But before that command uh, comes verse 24, which tells us to consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. That led us uh, at the beginning of the statement. That is the main action that is commanded here. Let us stir up or provoke one another to love and good works. And then what comes after that is the means by which we do that. Not neglecting to meet together and through encouraging one another. <clears throat> now, there are other passages in Scripture that teach us some of the other vital uh, purposes for gathering together as Christians. Acts 2 and 42 and 1 Timothy 4 and 13, for instance, instruct us to gather for teaching, reading of scriptures, celebrating the Lord's table, and for prayer. Colossians 3 and 16 encourages us to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But this first truth that we're looking at is also mentioned in each of those other scriptures I just mentioned. Colossians 3, for instance, before mentioning singing, tells us to teach and admonish each other in all wisdom. 1 Timothy 4 and 13 tells us to devote ourselves to the exhortation or encouragement of each other. <clears throat> I was at a funeral last Saturday of a close family friend. It was a wonderful service where a number of people got up and spoke of it, about his gentle nature, his love of his family, his love of his church, and most importantly, his love for the Lord. His grandson got up and told a story about, um, now the, the sound system wasn't great, so I couldn't hear it completely. I didn't hear what the question was, but something about what do you think of people? And his reply was, people are coals. And that kind of confused his grandson. He didn't quite get that answer until he continued. And he said, coals together in a barbecue will burn together. They'll work together to create heat, and they'll burn for a long time. But if you take one of those coals and you set it off by itself, it's going to cool down very quickly and die out. And that's very true of us as believers. It came to my mind instantly that I'm going to be speaking about worship, and this is a great illustration. Um, that's why we are encouraged to stir up one another to love and good works. When we come together and encourage one another, we create that heat. Together we burn for a long time. And if we pull ourselves away from the gathering, we begin to cool. And the ability to lead a Christ-like life, to turn away from temptations, um, it becomes harder. When we don't meet regularly as uh, Christians, we're inviting into our lives a real risk uh, of falling away. And so we need encouragement from one another. The second truth is found in verse 25. And it is the first of two means uh, to carry out that first command. In this verse, we're told not to neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some. And as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> this is the first means of encouraging one another, um, and you can't have one without the other. You need to be present at the gathering to be encouraged, and you need others there to be able to encourage them. Again, when I look at the live streaming, it was a, it's a great option for those who are housebound, who have no ability to gather amongst us. They're still able to get teaching. They're still able to enjoy the hymns and the singing. <clears throat> but the fellowshipping and the encouragement with one another, it's not there. It's what we were missing during the pandemic. But the message from the writer of the Hebrews is to not neglect meeting together. 
And he adds in this phrase, as is the habit of some. Now, I don't know why he added this to the letter. Maybe it was a little nudge to someone. Hey, George, I'm talking about you. I'm not going to name you, but listen up. Or maybe there was a larger issue within that congregation that he was addressing. Either way, it's a reminder to us that there will always be temptation, at least for some of us, not to get together regularly. Things happen and we can go through discouraging times and it's easy to withdraw. And I'm not suggesting that it's ever wrong to, or that it's never wrong to, no, I was right the first time. I'm not suggesting it was ever, it's ever right, ever wrong, I'll get this right. <laughs> now I feel like one of Sharmilla's games at the luncheons. Right, wrong, right? Anyway, I'm not suggesting that it's ever wrong to miss a service. That's not what is being taught here. The phrase used by the writer of the Hebrews is, as is the habit of some. There's always things that will come up. A change, a last minute change in work schedules, uh, illness, a vacation, things that cause us to meet, miss a meeting here and there. But what is required from this passage is to meet together and to have meetings together regularly as a habit. For instance, if someone came up to you on January 1st and they said, I'm, I'm making a New Year's resolution to get in shape. It's going to be my new habit. And you say, that's great. It's great to have goals. Um, are you going to go get a gym membership? Are you going to lift weights? Maybe start running? And they say, well, I'm going to do 10 jumping jacks once a week. For the majority of people, that's not a habit that's going to accomplish the goal that was set. In order for a habit to become a habit, it has to be, a reg it has to be regular and fairly consistent. I already mentioned Acts 2 and 42, but listen again and pay particular attention to the way that the assembly of Christians is described as the inspired pattern. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, with the key word there being devoted. Further down in verse 46, we read that they gathered together almost daily. Now that's devoted. But this doesn't just happen. Making something a habit requires us to prioritize it. <clears throat> we need to train ourselves in that thing that we want to make a habit. And so I encourage you to prioritize the Sunday gathering. Prioritize coming together and encouraging one another. Make this Sunday morning worship service a habit. There's some Sundays when the weather isn't so good, and there's some Sundays when the weather is very good but make gathering with God's people at the church your priority. There are some Sundays when there are competing interests, competing things to, that we can do, but make gathering together with the church family in the category of non-negotiables. My parents did a good job of this. I can't remember a, a Sunday when we ever stayed home just because we didn't feel like it. There was always a, a good reason and if we went away on vacation, there was always an extra suitcase for the Sunday clothes because wherever we went, we were going to be meeting with a church. I'm not telling you that's what you need to do because I'd have to look at myself as well. But what I am saying is we need to make gathering together our priority, our habit, in order to build one another up. The third uh, point, which falls in line with the previous two, comes from the last, uh, last part of verse 25, and we are told to encourage one another <clears throat> and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This command tells us that we each have a job to do. We are to encourage one another. We need encouragement, as I mentioned in my first point, but the main command that doesn't say, let us consider how to be encouraged as we gather together even though the scripture absolutely implies that we will be encouraged when we meet together. But instead, it tells us to consider, uh, it, it tells us to come seeking to stir up one another. We're 
to consider how we can fill that job of encouragement. If you look at the church only as an opportunity for personal devotion, uh, learning and worship, <clears throat> and not thinking of the people around you, um, not thinking about how you can be a blessing to their lives, it's likely that you'll walk out not being encouraged yourself. Even hearing preaching and teaching, which is foundational and essential, it might not be enough to be encouraged. Jesus didn't come to look out for his own interests. He came to look out for the interest of those around him, the lost, the lonely, the sick, the poor, the discouraged. When we walk into this building, we want to remember that we have a job to do. This gathering is not just a ministry of receiving. The gathering is a, a ministry of giving and encouraging. Jesus said that it's better to give than to receive. And you can almost guarantee that you will leave more encouraged uh, than when you walked in if you focus on encouraging others. As I close, I want to point out that there are two types of worship. Personal worship that takes place at any moment of the day, wherever we are. We praise our God who created us, who guards and keeps us. We praise him for his power and his glory, for his great love to us, demonstrated through his son. And we do this as well when we gather corporately, uh, when we gather habitually for corporate worship. But we are also commanded to stir one another up, encourage one another, and be encouraged. Be the hot coals burning in our desire for the things of Christ becoming more sanctified until he comes again. May God bless his encouragement to us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, as we close this time of reflection and learning, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together today to explore the depths of your word and the beauty of worship. Lord, we're reminded of these three steps in our Christian journey, justification, sanctification and glorification we thank you for the gift of salvation through jesus christ our savior and our redeemer help us to continually grow in our faith and become more like christ each day through spiritual disciplines such as prayer studying your word fellowshipping with one another and worship today as we focus on the discipline of worship we're reminded of king david's example of worshiping you in both the good times and throughout trials. Like him, may we recognize you as our creator and our strength. Help us to constantly see your power and your glory displayed in creation and in our lives. May our worship be a continually, continual offering of praise and adoration for your steadfast love and faithfulness. Lord, as we gather corporately, help us to stir one another up to love and good works. Grant us the grace to prioritize gathering together regularly, knowing that in doing so, we find encouragement and strength to persevere in our faith journey. Teach us to encourage one another and to be a source of blessing and inspiration to those around us. As we leave this place, may the truths that we have learned today resonate in our hearts and guide our actions. May our lives be living testimonies of your grace and love to the world around us. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat>